Welcome. Uh, today with me I have Mr. Brian McLean. Uh, he is retiring at the end of December. Uh, he is the subject matter expert on command relationships for the Department of Air Force. I, as one of my uh, pending roles, uh, has been tasked with learning and uh, taking over this role from uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, Bingo. Um, Morning, Chris. Thank, thank you. you. Glad, glad to be here. And it, this is kind of, kind of a difficult spot for me. Having been doing this for quite a while, it's time to pass on to the next. So if we can do that today, let's have fun with it. So as we've already talked, I've brought up, a, a, I got a whole list of questions here. We're gonna, uh, you know, pick your brain at on command relationships, COMI4, JFAC roles, Air Component Commander, just to get an understanding, not only for my learning, but for the viewers learning out there too that may be watching these videos. So to get right into it, you know, uh, my first question for you today is, what are some of the more common misconceptions that you get asked on a day-to-day -day basis as it relates to command relationships? Okay, well, Chris, the, I think we've been fortunate over the last 20 years that the knowledge level in the Air Force has increased greatly. So when I started doing this, basic questions would have been more frequent, not even understanding it. Now I think most of our airmen understand command relationships whether or not they realize it. So what I find myself dealing with most frequently now is a lack of precision in terminology. Uh, for instance, and I, I know you have a couple more questions, we'll go into more detail on this, but sometimes you'll hear one saying, uh, I'm going to chop take on this force over to the Army Battalion Commander. <laughs> and when I hear that, I cringe because the terminology is wrong. And the unfortunate thing about that is words have meaning. And when you're dealing with command relationships, you're putting people in harm's way. Words have very important meaning. So yeah. we strive to get them correct. Thank you. Um, so moving along to the next question, can you talk to us about uh, assigned versus attached? And what's the difference in these, this terminology? Yeah, sure, glad to. In fact, that, that's one of the common language precision things. When we talk assigned in forces and in Air Force terminology, it has a specific meaning. It means that a force, and we're all forces. You're a force, I'm a force. Uh, the aircraft out on the ramp are forces. The squadron they fly for, these are all forces writ large. When you're providing forces to a joint force commander for employment, if they are permanently given to that combatant commander, the term used is assigned. That means they're permanently placed under that combatant commander's orders. And the mechanism for doing this is called the Secretary of Defense's Forces for Operational Commands Memorandum, which is a mouthful, so we usually just call it the Forces for Memo. That's how they're assigned and take SECDEF action to do that, mm -hmm. although the Secretary of the Air Force is the one that actually chooses them, it's the Secretary of Defense that approves that choice. But if you want to go through that problem and that process to move a force from, say, you have them assigned to Indopac, mm -hmm. but they're needed for operations in CENTCOM. You okay. need to move them. You temporarily attach them. An attachment is I am removing that force, that squadron, that wing, that airman, from the command to whom it is assigned, and I'm temporarily placing it under another command via attachment. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, can you talk to us about, I hear a lot about supported supporting. Can you talk to us about, you know, what the difference in that is? Sure, sure. Support is a specific command relationship. And as you'll encounter as you take over and giving these briefings to other services, in joint terminology, support is a command relationship. You talk with the Army, they view support as a mission. So there's a little bit of disconnect in the language, okay. but we'll use the joint language. Let's say I am now supporting you. That's a method of expressing a priority. You have the priority of what's to be accomplished. I am the supporting commander. 
what I own, what I can bring to the fight, I use to make sure your objectives get carried out because you're the supported commander. Now, you don't get to command my forces. You don't have a command relationship over my squadron of A-10s that's mm -hmm. providing close air support to you. But you can tell me, I need this done. I need close air support. And then with my command as a supporting commander, I'll give orders to my forces to carry that out. That's supported and supporting. Okay. Well, who sets that up? Who's our common boss? Sometimes I like to relate this to kid at Christmas. You have a supported grandchild, and I'm the supporting grandfather, and the kid wants everything. And I can't give him everything. I don't have it. So I have to get priorities. Well, who set up that relationship and who makes the priorities? Grandma. She's the common superior over both of us. So you have supported, gets the priority of the effort to be done. Supporting meets that priority with command of their own forces. Common superior establishes that supported, supporting relationship and lays out who has priority for which. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, can you talk to, us, uh, talk to us about OpCon versus TakeCon versus support, and really what's the difference? Yeah, sure thing. Command relationships. When you place forces under a commander, particularly if you're going to go in harm's way, that commander needs lawful authority to put those forces in harm's way, and these types of authorities are included in operational control and tactical control or support. Now, we already talked about support, mm -hmm. okay? If I'm the supporting commander, I keep OpCon and TakeOn over my forces. You, as the supporting commander, tell, tell me what you need done, and I keep OpCon and TakeOn. Well, what's OpCon, what's TakeOn? Operational control is all the authority I need as a commander to do the mission I am given. I can organize the force, I can task the force, I can train it to accomplish a mission, I can direct it how it's going to accomplish that mission. And if there is a requirement for a waiver to existing standards, let's say a crew duty day, to get the mission done, I've got to go 15 hours into a 12-hour crew duty day. Mm -hmm. If I have operational control, I can extend the crew duty day to get the mission done. That's OpCon. Okay. You asked me also, though, about TakeOn. Tactical control is specific as to target, Timing, location, detail. It's more granular than OpCon. So when I go from the broad OpCon of I have to establish air superiority and I'm going to employ these forces to do it, into the more granular tactical control, I'm going to establish air superiority by attacking this enemy airfield with these weapons at this time, mm -hmm. that's an expression of tactical control. Tactical control is normally within operational control. So okay. you just go more granular. Okay. As a follow-up question to this, this conversation about OpCon, TakeCon support, how does administrative control play into this? Okay. That actually, going back to your first question, some of the misconceptions, that's one of the big ones. Within American forces, U.S. chain of command, we have two branches. Operational control, which we've just been talking about, that's the put forces in harm's way. That's how you go do a mission. And that goes to a joint force commander, to a combatant command. But at the same time, if you're gonna do a mission, if you're gonna drop a bomb, if you're gonna shoot bullets, somebody's gotta load that bomb. Somebody's gotta buy those bullets. Those actions, referred to as organized, trained, and equipped, those actions are accomplished through administrative control, and that is a service function. It doesn't go through the combatant commander. It goes through the secretary of the Air Force, to the chief of staff of the Air Force, and then down through MAGCOMs, NAFs, groups, and squadrons. You can't do one without the other. They're okay. linked. But operational belongs to the joint force. Administrative belongs to the service. They mesh together to get the job done. Okay. Thank you. Um, we you, you mentioned it uh, a little bit before, we, you talked about uh, the Forces 4 mem Memorandum. Yep. But to ask the question differently, uh, you know, how are forces provided? Can you walk us through the process of the sex deaths 
uh, forces four men to random, and how thirsty, <laughs> and how combat commanders get forces, and the level of command over those forces. Well, I can try. <laughs> it it all begins with U.S. Code, Title Ten, which requires the president to establish combatant commands and provide forces to those combatant commands. Okay. This is this is long winded. So if you need a cup of coffee, okay. now be the time to get all right. But from that is established a combatant command. Well, we all know CENTCOM, Indopac, UCOM, these are combatant commands. The president establishes them and directs the Secretary of Defense to provide forces to them. And that's called the Forces Four Memorandum. The Forces Four is published biannually and it lists all of the wings, groups, squadrons, battalions, aircraft carriers by type that are assigned, remember we talked assigned and attached, assigned permanently to that combatant commander. The secretary selects them, the secretary of defense approves them, they're published in the forces for. Well, let's say one of those needs to go somewhere else to do something. Mm -hmm. So you need to, for lack of a better term, let's say we need to borrow an aircraft carrier from Indopac to go do operations in Africa. That gets to attachment. And because we're going across combatant command lines, that requires the Secretary of Defense approval. So the combatant commander that needs the force submits a request for forces, an RFF. Mm -hmm. It goes up the process through the Joint Staff, is handed down to the combatant commander or the service that's going to provide that force. And then through Secretary of Defense orders, that selected force is temporarily removed from the command to whom it's assigned and attached to the gaining combatant command. So that's the RFF process. That's for a contingency. Mm -hmm. A similar process is done for rotational forces. Let's say you're going to send forces forward to be a physical presence for the next year and it's mm -hmm. a regular rotation. Uh, same system. Same process, except instead of a one-off RFF, it's done through what's called the Global Force Management Allocation Process. Again, the Secretary of Defense signs off on it. The selected battalion, selected uh, aircraft squadron, moves from its permanent location to its deployed location, and they change the command relationship to the gaining combatant commander. Okay. Thank you. Uh, let's let's move along uh, away from some terminology stuff, and and let's get into some more specific stuff. Uh, I hear a lot of questions revolving around a confusion between COMAF4 versus JFAC roles. Can you tell us uh, kind of the difference between the two? Well, for the most part, as far as the Air Force is concerned, they're the same. <laughs> but getting back to precision of language, commander of Air Force forces. Get joint forces, they're made up of service components. You know, forces four attached, that's a service. The service is what brings the forces to the, to the joint force commander. And you always have a service component commander. Because when they bring them in, they come in as what's referred to in doctrine as a service component. It's commanded by the senior Air Force officer eligible for command and in Air Force doctrine, Air Force terminology, and joint terminology, that senior officer in command of Air Force forces is called the commander of Air Force forces, the COMF-4. Now in that role, the COMF-4 has administrative authority, ADCON, over the service forces because somebody's got to make sure that you're organized, trained, equipped. You want somebody to pay your paycheck, yeah. right? You want somebody to make sure there's communication between you and your home station. That's ADCON. That's done by the service, and the COMAF-4 and the Joint Force is responsible for that. But we don't usually fight anymore as a service. We fight as what's called a functional component commander. And in air, it's JFAC, Joint Force Air Component Commander. And the JFAC takes all of the Joint Forces, the Air Forces, Air Force Air, Naval Aviation, Marine Aviation, possibly Army Aviation, in some rare cases, special operations aviation. All of these air forces 
that all fight through the air. The JFAC is given control over them to best organize and employ what is in reality a limited density, low, low quantity, but it's high demand. Now you've got the COMF-4, you have to have, which is administrative control over Air Force forces. Then the Joint Force Commander establishes the JFAC. Now that, again, that's another one of these common misconceptions. The Air Force doesn't provide a JFAC. We provide a COMF-4 that is prepared to be the JFAC Correct. if the Joint Force Commander so names. Uh, I told you at the start of this, Air Force thinks of the same thing. <laughs> That's not braggadocio. That is historic experience. For okay. more than 20 years, the Joint Force Commander has always designated the COMF-4 as the JFAC. And to avoid saying COMF-4 slash JFAC every time we talk, Air Force Doctrine, we refer to the Air Component Commander, which is the dual-hatted COMF-4 JFAC with responsibilities uh, in both branches. Okay. Thank you. As a follow-up question to that, and this just occurred to me. Um, if the air component commander is assigned forces from another force, what level of control do they have over those other service forces? Okay, well, you, you just used the terminology wrong. Okay. You, you, yeah, gotcha, Chris. All right. <laughs> I guess I can't leave yet, you know. <laughs> no, no uh, young Padawan. <laughs> Let me back up to what it says. The, the air component commander is not going to be assigned forces. Okay. He's going to be provided forces. So, referring to the Air Component Commander, we were talking about the combined COMF for JFAC. Mm -hmm. And so, what authority would the Air Component Commander have over Navy forces if the Air Component Commander is an Air Force officer? That was it. Correct. That, is, that authority is take on, which we discussed a little earlier. Detail as to I need this aircraft to hit this target at this time. I need this pallet load of equipment delivered to this location no later than this time. That's an expression of take on. And it's frequently, you know, the air tasking order, the ATO, is an mm -hmm. expression of take on. So what can I do with take on? I can tell you what to do. I can tell you when to do it. I can tell you uh, how to get to where you're going. Take on. What can I not do? I can't reorganize you. I can't tell you how to shape your service force to get the job done. If your service force is provided to do a specific type of function mm -hmm. with just take on, I can't order it to do a different function. For instance, I could, if, if I have a take on over an Air Force A-10 unit, I can order it to do CAS but I can't order it to do air superiority because that's not what it's trained for, if I have just take on. Okay. And I mentioned about organizing. OPCON includes the authority to organize. Every service, every one of us, zealously guards OPCON. Because if you're going to reorganize a service force, you need expertise on how to do that. If you're going to take it apart, you need to know what it affects and how to put it back together. So the service chain under operational control, zealously guards OPCON. And let me give you one example from years and years ago when I started doing this. I would frequently have one of my Navy compatriots when we we're having this type of discussion say, no, no, the JFAC should have OPCON. Okay, JFAC has OPCON. Yeah, yeah, okay. OPCON includes the authority to reorganize. Yeah, yeah. I'm an Air Force officer and I'm a JFAC. Yeah, yeah. I have OPCON over Navy Air. Uh, yeah, I can reorganize. Uh, maybe. Okay, take your air wing off the carrier, put it ashore. I'm reorganizing it. Okay, that's good enough. You can, you can just have take on. You'll be take okay on. with JFAC. <laughs> All right. You bring up some uh, good points there. Uh, so moving along, uh, what are some of the uh, most challenging uh, commands to be in and why as they relate to the air component commander? Uh, well, I, I can only refer to what I've seen mm -hmm. in 20. And over the last 20 years, the one command that stands out to me for the most challenge, uh, probably right now is Alaskan Command. 
because of the multitude of combatant commanders and service commanders that are all involved in Alaskan Command and 11th Air Force. Mm -hmm. You've got Alaskan Command, which is a subordinate unified command. It's a subdivision of the larger combatant command. That's a subordinate unified command under Northern Command. But the forces that would be used by Alaskan Command and the commander of Alaskan Command is the commander of 11th Air Force up in Alaska, Joint Base Elmendorf Richardson. 11th Air Force is under PACAF as part of Indo Pacific Command. At the same time, when you come back over to Alaskan Command, Alaskan Command also forms the core of the Alaskan NORAD region, which is US Canada. So you've got one commander of Alaskan Command, of 11th Air Force, of Alaskan NORAD region, under PACAP, Indopac, NORTHCOM, and NORAD all once. Oh, and by the way, he doesn't have any Air Force forces to do it. So I would say he has the most challenging position presently to be an Air Component Commander. He doesn't have forces permanently assigned but they're available to be attached. So mm -hmm. when he needs to do, when the commander of Alaskan, 11th Air Force, NORAD, needs to do something, they have to make sure they get them the right forces and go through that process to attach them uh, under his operational control to put them in harm's way. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so that kind of leads me into my next question. So uh, Indopaycom has forces in Alaska. Um, can you describe how uh, command and control works for when Air Force forces are transitioning from one AOR to another or from one geographic location to another? So, you know, does uh, Alaska, ha Alaska Command have control over Indo-PACOM Indo forces since they're in Alaska Command? Uh, the short answer to that is no, or not necessarily. You, we gotta unpack a really complex yeah. question you asked right there. Baseline physical location is not generally the determinant for the command relationship. Mm -hmm. It's to which commander that force is assigned or attacked. So if you're asking about transit forces, let's say that I have forces that I am moving from their location in Seymour Johnson Air Force Base, I'm taking F-15Es, and I'm moving them forward to Korea for an exercise and I'm transiting through Alaska. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, when they get to Korea, they're probably going to be attached under the operational control of Indopac, PACAF, and U.S. Forces Korea. They're probably going to be attached on that. But until they get there, just because they're transiting through NORTHCOM and Alaskan Command, that doesn't change the command relationship. The command relationship is to whom they're assigned or to whom they're attached later. Their physical presence as they go through doesn't change the command relationship. That answer is not quite as simple as that, though. Yeah. Because even though you may not be under the opcon or the take on of the combatant commander within whose AOR you're moving, you still are subject to that commander's authority for items like force protection and exercise control. Okay. So if you're transiting through Alaska and you're going to spend the night, and the local commander has some force protection measures enforced, you're required to abide by those force protection measures, even though it's not, not under his command, but you're subject to it because you're physically present there. And I'm gonna throw one more curve in there to you. This, this is one that's little known, but very important. And that is the authority of a combatant commander to take, not be given by the Secretary of Defense, but to take operational control of U.S. forces physically present within the AOR under emergency conditions. That was going to be my follow-up question. Oh, in an great segue, Chris. In, in an emergency <laughs> type situation, okay. it, there are some other forces that are in your AOR that aren't assigned or attached to you. Okay. What happens? What happens? Uh, now, I, I'll preface this with Commander of Northern Command does not have this authority within the United States. That's the authority I'm going to describe to take operational control 
Northern Command doesn't do it within the United States, and it gets to um, civilian control of the military. Well, let's say you have an emergency kicking off in European Command, and you have a force physically present in European Command, but it's not yet attached to European Command. Well, the commander of European Command, the combatant commander, this is the only one that has that authority. The combatant commander of European Command has the authority to reach out and say, I need this force because of this emergency. The combatant commander has to declare the emergency, has to state to the losing command and the Secretary of Defense why he's taking the force and how long he needs it. But he can physically take it if that force is physically present within his AOR. He can take operational control, so full mission control. And this happened once, uh, several years ago, during Operation Desert Storm. You know, not OIF, not OEF, but before mm -hmm. that Desert Storm. When Israel became threatened by missile attacks, possibility of missile attacks, and they needed to move air defense assets, into that area, the commander of European Command took control of an airlifter that was physically present in the AOR, ordered it to change its mission, upload the necessary air defense forces, and fly it. So that's an example of a commander taking control in an emergency. And by the way, that does not violate the general rule that moving forces from one combatant command to another requires Secretary of Defense approval. Mm -hmm. It doesn't violate it because the Secretary of Defense has already granted that approval to the combatant commanders. Okay. This may seem like a, a, a dumb follow-up question to that, but if a, a combatant commander takes control of another force in an emergency situation since they're already there, uh, what happened? who organized, trains, and equips uh, that unit? It, who who keeps that responsibility? Yeah, I got, the taking. I got to tell you, Chris, that that, that question's never been asked. I mean, you're the first person that's asked that question in 20 years. <laughs> uh, so let me let me think for a second on that. But the presumption would be that now that force, be it Air Force, Army, Navy, Marine, whatever force it is, mm -hmm. it's still part of a service. And in taking operational control of it the combatant commander is, in essence, making it now part of his or her assigned service component. So if it's an Air Force force that's not assigned to, using UCOM as an example, yeah. it's Air Force force not assigned to UCOM, and the combatant commander takes it for emergency conditions, that automatically makes it part of USAFE's chain of command. So. The combatant commander, UCOM, is going to, most likely, 999 times out of 1,000, is going to delegate OPCON over that force, the commander USAFE, mm -hmm. as the air component commander. And the commander USAFE picks up some elements of administrative control, responsibility, and authority, at least enough to make sure that that Air Force asset is properly employed, taken care of, You've got your air crews bedded down and protected, and you've got fuel for the jet. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, I've got one last question for you. I'm going to throw you up a little softball here. Uh, um, and, and, this is, and this will conclude our, our conversation. But is the SECDEF responsible for organizing, training, and equipped of service retained forces? Uh, short answer is yes, but you know me, Chris. You can't get a short answer out of me. So, yeah, the SECDEF ultimately is responsible for organizing, training, and equipping all forces because he's immediately below the president. But that chain then goes down to the service secretary. So, really, from the SECDEF, the secretary of the Air Force has the responsibility and authority to organize, train, and equip all Air Force forces. And that includes what are described as Air Force service retained forces. And you didn't ask me this, but I'm going to tell you, the problem is you asked me a question, so you got to listen while okay. I answer. Service retained forces are one of those that are fairly new in the lexicon and fairly new in force assignment. Previously, when we used to have United States Joint Forces Command, Joint Forces Command was generally the, the overall joint force provider. 
So if you had forces that weren't deployed and forward to UCOM, Indopac, etc., the bucket of available forces was all under Joint Forces Command. They were under a combatant commander. When they had to go forward, the Secretary of Defense gave the orders, relinquish operational control of this squadron, deploy it forward to CENTCOM, accept operational control. Well, a few years ago, Joint Forces Command went away. We still had these forces. So those forces that used to be assigned to Joint Forces Command were now created under a term called service retained forces. These are forces that are not assigned to a combatant commander, but are available to be attached as okay. required for contingency. They're your, your ready pool to call on. Uh, within the Air Force, Air Combat Command is not assigned to a combatant commander. It is a service-retained force, and all of Air Combat Command's assets are available to be deployed as necessary under SECDEF orders to go forward to one of the combatant commanders. Are um, reserve forces set up in this capacity? Yeah, they are. Air Force Reserve Command is a unassigned Air Force force. But again, it's not quite as simple as that because individual reserve forces, squadrons, wings, etc., individual reserve forces are listed in the Forces 4 as being assigned to specific combatant commanders. So there's a mix there. Okay. Air Force Reserve Command itself is not assigned, but, for instance, the uh, airlift wing we have here at Maxwell, if you go through the Forces 4 tabular data, you will find that it is assigned to a combatant commander for when it comes up into um, active status. Okay. All right. Well, that's all the questions I have for you today. I didn't hear in our normal conversations that me and you normally have, uh, the words, it depends, too much. <laughs> as, as if the one thing I've learned in conversations with you, every answer has a it depends on it, mostly. Uh, so hopefully in the future, maybe even after retirement, we can get you back and ask you some more questions, and maybe we can hear some of those, it uh, depends. I'll, I'll be but, glad to. But I'd like to thank you for your time, and thanks for, thanks for answering these questions for me and everyone else. My pleasure, Chris. Thanks. Do well. Thank you.